today we're talking about coffee and critical listening. Okay, but before we talk about coffee, we're going to talk about dynamic range. Dynamic range is um, the ratio um, of the lowest measured level of something to the highest level measured of something. And, and the most sort of probably commonly known for us would be sound. And for our hearing, for example, we take the lowest sound we can hear to the loudest sound we can bear. And that is expressed in decibels. And that's a logarithmic scale because the numbers are so huge. Um, but many things can be uh, described in terms of dynamic range. Now, coffee. Let's say you've only ever drunk uh, instant coffee your whole life, never anything else. Your dynamic range is very narrow. You've got an experience of one. And, um, you know, however, if you've experienced the, the worst coffee you can buy and the very best coffee you can buy, then you have a very wide dynamic range. Now, for me, the worst coffee I ever had was at Perth Airport at about one o'clock in the morning and I probably could have used it to run the battery in my car. And the best one, ironically, was at a little rural airport in Myanmar where they had a croissant and coffee shop and I thought this was going to be dreadful but I just wanted the caffeine and it was the best coffee I've ever experienced. Um, now, I must say, I've since become hooked on James Hoffman's YouTube channel, and if you're into coffee, check him out. Um, I have to blame him for an increase in my caffeine addiction, um, but he certainly elevated the art of coffee for me. All right, so in, in terms of coffee, um, you know, if we've got this expanded dynamic range, we can then start to judge whether for us personally a coffee is good or bad. But there's one more problem left. Can I describe that experience? Now, coffee tasters have language, and I'm not that familiar with it, but it involves bitterness, acidity, body, and, and so on and so forth. And these are the critical factors uh, that go into the language that they use to explain how coffee tastes. With TVs, we have um, measurements I can take with the sensor that can tell me the quality of the picture. And we have a very clearly defined standard for that. It's not something that's left to even the human eye. I can measure it and, and we can adjust it and I can say that is studio perfect. Sound or audio, not so much. The standards are almost non existent and a lot looser. Um, there are certain things that we want to make sure we don't have, and that's distortion and uh, and those sorts of things. And we want to make sure that you know polarity is correct and that you know our frequency response is there. But that actually doesn't really describe the quality of the sound. Now, um, so when it comes to that, we need a common language. I need a way to be able to listen to the rooms that we design and build, or listen to a customer's room or communicate over the sound of a speaker to somebody and I need a way to do that. Um, if you have only ever experienced um, a TV uh, in your lounge room then again your dynamic range is very limited and you know uh, you may be very happy with that and that's fine but there are people out there who want to uh, make sure that if they've bought a TV or an amplifier or an AV processor or speakers or a surround sound system or even a fully dedicated cinema, how do I know that my TV and the other equipment is actually performing at its very best? You've probably invested a bit of money in this and you want to know that, you know, when you turn it on, it's actually delivering every cent's worth of performance that you paid for it. And the fact is, most things out of the box simply don't. But you need to communicate that. Now with the TV, calibrators do that. That's not a problem. And with audio, we sort of line up the sound in your room and we get it correct. But there is a very, very uh, nebulous factor that goes into this and that comes back to that language. The solution for this, I credit with Jerry LeMay at the HAA. Now there may be other systems out there. I'm not aware of them. I learned this from him oh, coming on 20 years ago, I guess. I'm not sure exactly when. Um, 
But when you do an HA, Home Acoustic Alliance course, Jerry teaches you that the first thing you need to do is critically listen to what's going on. If you don't, how do you know if you've made an improvement? How do you know if it's changed? Now, one of my beefs is all these videos on YouTube with people putting in acoustic treatment and they just slap eggshell foam all around the room, walk in the room, clap their hands and say, see, it sounds better. No, it doesn't sound better. It sounds different. And we can actually do a lot of harm to sound if we don't know what we're doing. But the thing is, if our dynamic range is small and we experience a change, we can just go, I think that's better. We can actually label it as better when in fact it could be worse. So how do we know that it's getting better? How do we know we've done a good job? Some of it can be measured. We can check the frequency response. Um, we can check, um, as I said, distortion and, and other factors. And we can make sure that the unit's not clipping, etc. But in terms of the quality of the sound, we need a language. We have that. So Jerry LeMay created the HAA Home Acoustic Alliance Critical Listening Worksheet. What this is, is a language, <laughs> I've got coffee all over this, um, is a language that we can use to communicate this and either between each other or for ourselves with incremental changes. Now, I'm going to go through this. I'm just going to pop the headings up um, above me here, um, but it consists of five factors, the five critical listening factors, and this is the language we use. Now, the interesting thing is, I read a review some time ago about some speakers and the reviewer said they sounded chocolatey. <laughs> it's like, really? Chocolatey? Was that milk chocolate? Dark chocolate? Was that white chocolate? Or maybe hazelnut? Rum and raisin? Freddo frog, maybe? I don't know. Caramello bear? It, 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 I guess he's trying to say the sound was smooth, but maybe tasty? Who knows? The thing is, that doesn't help me. And, and throwing words out that you use that's different to another reviewer or different to another marketer or different to another manufacturer is hopeless to us as consumers. So we come back to this. I would personally love to see everybody settling on this as a listening standard. Anyway, let's get back into it. So on the critical listening worksheet, I remember I've broken it down into an acronym for me. It's CFERD, C-F-E-R-D. And this stands for clarity, focus, envelopment, response, and dynamics. And I'm going to break that down a bit. I'm not going to dwell on it too much because in the description below, you can actually download this worksheet, thanks to Jerry LeMay. And it actually explains each and every one of these points and how you arrive at them. But let's break it down just a little bit. Okay, um, first of all, let me give you his explanation as to why he created this and what it's all about. The HA Critical Listening Worksheet was designed to provide three basic contributions to the calibration process. Now, it's greater than that, the testing process, the reviewing process, the assessment process. The common language to describe the characteristics of sonic goals is one. Two, a score sheet from which a calibrator or listener can become more consistent in the assessment of performance, and three, that you can educate customers on the real capabilities of high-definition audio systems. I think it goes much, much deeper than that. I think Jerry sort of undersold the process, to be honest. Now, you also need reference material, and it says here, the selection of reference material shown here, it's actually not in this document, is not designed to be all-inclusive or represent the state of audio reproduction art. We use stereo recordings because from an instructional vantage, the experience of these qualities is easier to detect, yet they are relevant for all types of uh, recordings, including multi-channel. Right, so the first point is clarity, and clarity is broken down into three sections. The first one is dialogue intelligibility. Uh, this is the attribute that's probably easiest to understand. There is no movie enjoyment where the listener is challenged to understand dialogue or lyrics. It's very simple. Um, if you don't understand or you don't have clarity of voice or lyrics, then dialogue intelligibility is missing. Instrumental texture is any recorded instrument, including the human voice, which is a, a rich tapestry of sounds, and you need to hear the range 
of that, including things like a bow rubbing on a violin string to a guitar pick plucking a string, and these are good tests of such resolution. Low level detail, the experience of being teleported to another time or place involves a sense of space. The subtle details hidden in the ambient sound field of a recording bring such an experience to life. Right, so that is clarity, dialogue intelligibility, instrumental texture and low level detailing. Read it here, it will make a bit more sense. Okay, the next one is focus. Now, item one in focus is precision localization. Item two is image stability. And item three is instrumental dimension. So precision localization pretty much speaks for itself. Can you really tell where a sound is coming from? The second part is how stable is that sound? Does it drift around the room or, or is it pinpoint accurate and does it stay there if it's meant to? And third, instrumental dimension. If the instrument is a big wide instrument like a piano, does it feel that way? Or if it's a pinpoint source like a piccolo, does it stay there? All right. The third one is envelopment. Right. Um, I'm just going to flip to the next page so that I'm actually reading Jerry's notes accurately. Um, the third one is envelopment, and this covers depth, continuity, and surround field, surround field cohesiveness. So in depth, he says the sound stage is composed of a series of stereo images superimposed on each other to create a sonic experience. The backdrop for this is the ambient sound field. The furthest sense of depth in any recording is this ambience, and the instruments furthest away from the microphone. So what he's saying is, um, you know, how deep and expansive is that surround field? If your surround field is supposed to be a forest and it feels like you're sitting in a lounge room, then, then that's not working. Okay. Um, then there is continuity. For multi-channel systems, the surround field should be seamless without interruption. So as the sound moves around, uh, up, down, left and right, um, front to back, it should appear smooth and without interruption. And surround field cohesiveness uh, an element relating to any frequency shift that's observed as the sound pans around. So you should have timber or timbre matched your speakers and things should not change. You know, if you've got a consistent sound, if a helicopter is full bodied here, but it's kind of weak and tinny here and then it's full bodied here, you're sort of, you're going to be distracted. Okay. The fourth element is dynamics. And in dynamics, we have effortlessness, dynamic contrast and subtlety. So effortlessness is how well um, a system can ch can cope with those changes in dynamics, right? Um, can it reproduce those loud passages with ease without adding any distortion, but still maintain the clarity in the lower passages? And then dynamic contrast describes the reproduction of transients. Extremely dy dynamic instruments like pianos and drums and even human voice can sound dull or two-dimensional without properly reproduced dynamics. This is a sense of life and realism that can startle without appearing overwhelming. Okay, And the third one is subtlety. This describes the audibility of the quietest passage in a recording, often the sound of ambient noise, not electronic noise, recorded at the same time of the instrument and are important to related realism. Other details can be hidden by the compression of dynamics due to too much ambient noise. Right, And then the last one, response. So timbral or timbral accuracy. This can be difficult to ascertain without experience and, and listening to those um, uh, instruments. You need to know how the instrument sounded in the first place. Um, so they're saying basically when you reproduce the sound of a cello, does it actually sound like a cello? And you need to have heard it in real life and be able to understand that. So does the character remain? Smoothness. Whilst timber can be distorted by broad changes in response colouring the sound, more abrupt changes in response can become annoying. All right, so this is a sense of ringing or blurring of certain tones. For bass, the sound can seem monotone or hollow. We hear that a lot. People who've just put big subwoofers and have loaded up the room and all they get is boom, boom, boom. They don't really get tonal quality in their bass. Um, tonal extension is the next one. This describes the extent of high or low frequencies reproduced. The deepest bass tones require a subwoofer or very uh, large full range speaker. And tonal cohesiveness. Of particular importance is that each sonic image appears to be continuous and cohesive. Sound emitted from different drives can appear to disembody the sound um, most, no most, ah, try again. most noticeably when using a subwoofer. You need to ensure that the sound appears to come from the same place. 
If you haven't, you haven't really integrated, for example, your subwoofer properly. So that's it. You know, um, it's probably a lot to take in, you know, in a quick rundown. But the document is here, it's below, and it's available to download. On the front is a score sheet. So uh, on that score sheet, what you can actually do is you can do your first listening experience, or you can have multiple listeners in a room, and they can all score. And that's a good thing to do. You know, invite a few friends over, listen to some tracks, and score the tracks, and see how well you actually correlate. And once you start doing this for a while, you'll find that, in fact, you'll start to correlate similarly, which means you can have that conversation. For me, uh, when I'm calibrating a system, prior to calibration, I'll listen to the room, then I'll do a manual calibration, then I might try an auto calibration, and then I can have a look at these and score, and I can see where the improvements are in that room. I, could, I actually have a, a measurable value and experience, and I can also relate that to someone else. So I can talk to my business partner, Enzo, and say, that room was really good in terms of clarity and development, but it lacked dynamics. And he's going to go, I know exactly what you mean. There you go. We have a language. So there you go. Critical listening is really important, and the communication of that critical listening is really important. And it's the one way that we can share this language. You know, even in YouTube comments now, people can say, I've been listening to my room, and it's lacking envelopment. Why would that be? And I'll go, ha, I know exactly what you're talking about. All right. So there you go. I think this is immensely useful. I, I think it's a, a great thing to use. And uh, this is one of those tools that is much, much underrated. And uh, I've only ever really seen it used by people who have done the HA course and are calibrators. And even then, not all of them use this. So, um, yeah, I'd, I'd throw this out there. I'm certainly, if there are other systems, I would love to hear about them. Um, you know, we certainly don't know everything. Uh, but definitely get in touch, put your comments below, and uh, see how you go with this. I, I certainly think it would be great to see, to, to have a common language for everything. So there you go, folks. Um, and have a think about it. You know, expand, expand your dynamic range in coffee, wine, cars. There's plenty of other things in life that you can expand the, your dynamic range into. Um, but also, you know, bear in mind that this that now gives you uh, a way to look at the equipment you have and ask yourself, am I getting my money's worth? Am I getting the most out of it? You know, is it getting better? You know, can I extract the performance I paid for? And that's what really we're all about. It's making sure that when a system goes into a home, that it's not just a bunch of equipment, it's a bunch of equipment properly set up, properly tuned, so that you have the best experience possible with everything that's in there, that everything is running at its peak, that everything's working together like an orchestra in concert to deliver stunning results. And that's how we do it. That's how we measure. That's how we listen. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed it. I've certainly enjoyed my coffee. And um, yeah, thank you. Please don't forget to subscribe and um, to uh, set the notifications. And um, yeah, keep following us. Uh, we hope you're enjoying the videos. Thanks for watching.